thank our brothers from both the, the uh, university as well as our high school, Christian Brothers High School, for this evening. You are all very welcome. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Brother Dominic, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Christian Brothers University on behalf of the administration, faculty, staff, and students. Tonight we gather to honor the 2012 and the 40th recipient of the Bishop Carroll T. Dozier Award for Peace and Justice, Reverend Keith Norman. Reverend Norman is pastor of First Baptist Church, Broad Street. We welcome him as well as his wife, Alicia, and please stand, Alicia, and his children, Keenan and Kiera. Please stand. We 
We also welcome our special guests this evening, members of the boards of trustees, members of Pastor Norman's congregation, and we'd ask them to please stand, the members of the First Baptist Church, and a big round of applause. You're very welcome. Members of the Ladies First Assembly of St. Agnes Academy and their director, Scott Sadler, please stand. <laughs> welcome. And in a very special way, any former recipients of the Dozier Award that's in our audience. And if that's the case, please stand. At this time, I would like to introduce the stage party for this evening. Please stand as you're introduced, Dr. John Smorelli, the 22nd president of Christian Brothers University and our first layperson to serve in such a capacity in the 141 years of history at our LaSallean Institution of Higher Learning. The president will officially bestow the honor of the Dozier Award upon Reverend Norman this evening. Our Vicar General, of the Diocese of Memphis, Monsignor Peter Buccanani, who will offer a historical perspective on the Dozier Award and its significance, given Monsignor knew Bishop Dozier, our first bishop of the diocese, beginning in 1971. Brother Tom Sullivan and Miss Margreta Dobbs from the Office of Campus Ministry, who will assist the president in conferring the citation and the medal. And finally, Brother Moses Abunya, originally from the great country of Nigeria, who's a graduate student at the university. We welcome all our stage party. <laughs> at this time, it's my privilege to invite Brother Moses to lead us in our prayer this evening. Brother Moses. Peace prayer of St. Francis of Assisi. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. The Bishop Carol T. Dozier Award for Peace and Justice. Yes, I was privileged <coughs> to know Bishop Dozier and work with him on a daily basis when he first arrived in Memphis. I personally, from the day one, felt that I was in the presence of a feisty prophet who was not afraid to make you mad, who was not afraid to speak the truth of the gospel. And as I try to indicate the sort of man he was, I'm going to ask you, if possible, to try to consider the times in which these events occurred. Some things that we take for granted today were not quite seen that way 
throughout the 1970s. Bishop Dozier, to me, was an authority figure in the real sense of the gospel of Jesus Christ. An authority figure that would challenge your thinking and often change your behavior. On January 19 and January 6, 1971, he was ordained and installed as the first Catholic, uh, or the first bishop of the newly established Catholic Diocese of Memphis. He was a pastor who had come from Roanoke, Virginia and made bishop at the age of 58, which at that time was seen as a bit old to be made a bishop. He served as our first bishop from 1971, and due to health reasons, he retired in 1982. Although Bishop Dozier, he loved the grandiose. In 1980, he was already planning a huge retirement of the first Bishop of Memphis in 1985, but health would not permit it. He died in 1985, retired in 1982, and died at the age of 72 in 1985. I recall at the time of his retirement, by many, the paper, and others, he was called by some at that time as the most prominent clergyman in the city of Memphis. As I said to me personally, he was very prophetic. I recall one day, if you're familiar with the city of Memphis, the land upon what is now St. Peter's, well in that day was St. Peter's Orphanage on the corner of Poplar and McLean. And this was just shortly after he arrived. I was driving him around one day, and he had that Virginia drawl. He said, Peter! <laughs> he looked at this land of St. Peter's, which at that time contained an orphanage and a nursery, and that was it. He said, Thou is all of life. I envisioned, th I envisioned this property celebrating life from the moment of birth till the elderly. And over the years, he was able to build a nursing home to care for the sick and the infirm, St. Peter's Manor and other manors throughout the diocese to care for the elderly of all faith. Truly, this man was a visionary. He was fearless to speak the gospel. As I said, he had a gift and a challenge to be able to see the larger picture. He was a human being, but I, by that what I meant, he had a difficult time dealing with the day-to-day -day details of issues. He left that to others. Peter, take care of it. His mind was always focused on what we as a church could be and on what we as a church should be. And when I say church, I'm not talking just about Catholic. I meant the churches of Memphis, how they should be united and working together. He wrote a number of pastoral letters in which he challenged not only his Catholic people, but people of all faith and the city to consider all the areas of peace and justice in some ways that were tearing the city apart. With others, he was responsible for bringing an organization called Pax Christi to Memphis and really spearheaded with others the establishment of what we call the Catholic Peace Movement here in the city. I think one of his first letters was entitled, Peace, Gift, and task, a gift that brought with it responsibility. He was not afraid. He strongly opposed the war in Vietnam. And for those of you old enough to remember, that war thoroughly divided and tore this country apart. And Bishop Dozier came out in opposition to the war saying it was immoral. 
One thing about Bishop Dozier, he not only spoke up, he took decisive action on every issue that he spoke about. Because of his feelings on the war in Vietnam, he strongly supported conscientious objection. He set up a strong counseling program to assist those who were genuine conscientious, if I can say that correctly, objectors to the war. He was one of the earlier pioneers in Memphis on promoting women's right, the equality of women. He also was one of the first in Memphis to support busing to bring about better racial equality. He strongly promoted the life, the issue of life from the moment of conception until death. Bishop Dozier had a unique way of not just being critical, but of celebrating. When I recall in 73, when the Supreme Court came out with the Roe versus Wade abortion decision, Bishop Dozier, of course, took a verbal strong stand, but he also conducted a year or so later a large celebration in the Miss South Coliseum to promote and celebrate life. He said to me one day, Peter! <laughs> I get tired and mad when people say we must defend the faith. You don't defend the truth, you celebrate it. And Bishop Dozier was always celebrating the issues that he felt so passionately about. He had a great outreach for the marginalized and the poor. He developed in our diocese a strong ministry to the sick and to the imprisoned. He took a strong stand in opposition to capital punishment. As I've noted briefly, he was, had showed great concern for the infirm and the elderly. He was able, in the Reagan administration, because the government money was there, to erect manors and houses for the poor and the disadvantaged. He celebrated all of life. He had special outreach uh, to fallen away Catholics, people who for whatever reason had left the church. He had planned for months in advance and had a large celebration in which he called people back that the church first would be reconciled to them, the lost members who in turn could thus be reconciled to the church. He was always looking for ways to celebrate the issues he felt strong about. And this was revolutionary in the 70s. He was an early leader in what we would call the ecumenical movement. He made a great effort to befriend Protestant ministers of many religions, rabbis, and others having them often over his house. Whenever we had a celebration, he would always make sure that the clergy of other faith in the city of Memphis were included in those celebrations, where Catholics and Protestants and Jews and other religions could come together to find out what they had in common rather than what often united them. As I said, Bishop Dozier had a way of celebrating, praying together, and proclaiming the gospel. He was our first bishop. I cannot think of any issue that Bishop Dozier was not willing to tackle and to speak out very strongly for, but at the same time, to come in up the way to celebrate that. What kind of a church do you want to be, he challenged the Catholics and the people of Memphis. He took the gospel. He preached the gospel. He was not afraid to prophesy that gospel, and he backed that gospel up with decisive actions. I am honored to be able to, I hope, give some living, dynamic face to the award that is to be given tonight. Thank you, Monsignor. You certainly uh, 
gave a bird's eye view of the bishop, of the late bishop, and very enthusiastically you spoke from the heart and you spoke from experience. And we're grateful that you're here and that you were able to speak such. Thank you so much. At this time, we would like to hear from Ladies First from St. Agnes Academy. ladies. At this time we'll begin the process of conferring of the award and the medal for Bishop Dozier, the award, to Reverend Keith Norman. We'd ask him to please stand and come forward. We'd also ask uh, our two campus ministers, Brother Tom and Margaret Dobbs, to come forward. 
and we'd ask our president to please stand and come forward. First, we'll read the citation and present the citation to Reverend Norman, and then the medal, the citation. Christian Brothers University, Bishop Carol T. Dozier Award for Peace and Justice, Pastor Keith Norman. Pastor Keith Norman, you have shepherded a ministry serving a community predominantly in transition, targeted for revitalization in housing, education, and crime prevention. Your ongoing campaign of community revitalization and strategic planning in the Memphis community has yielded the HOPE Hope Zone, that is, Haven of Perfective Empowerment, dedicated to Christian education, senior living, and temporary housing for the homeless, and Greater Works Incorporated, a ministry with emphasis in organizational management aimed at empowering churches. Not confined to Memphis, your work spans the globe, from a revital in South America to lectures in West Africa. Regardless of the location, your message and vision are unwavering. You espouse, quote, inspiration without activism is just empty rhetoric. Putting this into action, you relentlessly pursue opportunities to improve education, housing, places of worship, and life in general for those most in need, always respecting the individual and preserving the dignity of each person and recognizing that change can occur even in the most impoverished and dismal neighborhoods. As a pillar of the youth violence prevention movement, you have led the charge to provide alternatives for our youth. Through your church and ministry, you set high standards, high expectations, and high accountability. By always working through love and the grace of God, you have raised our youth up, released their potential, and ensured that they become contributing members of our society. Pastor Norman, as a faith-based community, committed to social equality, religious freedom, and community activism, Christian Brothers University is pleased to honor you today with the Bishop Carol T. Dozier Award for Peace and Justice. Named for another who fought against social injustice, the Dozier Award is given in recognition of your commitment to community activism and dedication to serving those most in need. May God continue to bless you in your life and work. Declared this second day of October 2012, signed Dr. John Smarelli, Jr. President, and Mr. Robert G. McInerney, Chairman, Board of Trustees. Congratulations, Pastor Norman. God alone be the glory. These are the words that you will find at over 300 compositions by Johann Sebastian Bach. He began by recognizing that no great thing came from him alone, but it was by the hand of God placed upon him. Amazingly, at the end of those same compositions, you would find those three letters, SDG, Sola Dea Gloria. 
to God alone be the glory. In absence of the Most Reverend Bishop Terry Stibe, to Monsignor Peter Buchanani, Christian Brothers President Dr. John Smorelli, Special Assistant Brother Dominic, to the Board of Trustees of this great institution and to the graduates of this fine institution, I am honored to receive this award, not only on my behalf, but on behalf of the members of the First Baptist Church and my family. To be included among such an extreme group of men and women whom have accomplished such fine things, it is an honor. To each of you, please receive these words of personal gratitude for you allowing me to be a public servant in the city of Memphis and the wonderful congregation of believers in Christ known as First Baptist Church Broad Avenue. I'm grateful to God and thankful to each of you. I'm humbled by your presence as you share this significant moment of time with me and my family. If you will allow me a few moments, I would like to say a few heartfelt thank yous to some very special people that hold a very special place in my heart. First, to Mrs. Gwen Atkins. Would you please stand? <laughs> Gwen is the wife of the late deacon Robert G. Atkins and a part of the St. Augustine Church family. It was through the suggestion of her husband, Deacon Robert Atkins, and the acceptance of those involved that my own personal journey began toward enlarging my ecumenical views of the world and God's kingdom. I served as the King Day celebrant at the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception. And it was at that pivotal point in my life that I began a personal journey towards a mission of seeking God's peace and justice by whatever means of power and authority the Lord had invested in me. I'm grateful that he suggested my name and I will never forget his contributions to my life. I want to thank my wife, Alicia, and my children, Keith, Kiasia, Keenan, and Kiara. Kiara is at a concert and she is on her way here, but she chose to get the grade first and then come and see dad. <laughs> I thank my four children because they give me a life filled with memories and practical metaphors that give vivid imagery to my otherwise dull preaching. Many have come to clearly see the compassion of Jesus Christ because I can always use an illustration of my children in the preaching moment. Most especially to my mother, would you please stand? My mother is my living example of love, concern, and caring for others, and seeing to their needs, even when she was not sure of how our own needs would be met. It was my mother's steadfastness, tempered by faith, that invited my friends to our dinner table, even when I knew that there wasn't enough to feed her own family. But because she was not willing to allow any of my friends to go without a meal, she always made one more seat at the table. To my brother James and to my brothers and sisters who are not here, Rudy, Greta, Regina, and Katrina, I thank them as well. Awards are wonderful reminders that daydreaming can be a fun excursion away from reality. If but for a moment today, the world seemed to be perfect. For today, my two children who are away from home and college called to congratulate me, and neither one of them asked for money. <laughs> However, at the conclusion of the conversation, they said, we'll call you tomorrow because we have some other things to talk about. <laughs> today, my two younger children came straight to the car after school because they knew we had a busy agenda tonight. But tomorrow, they will remind me to be there at 2.15 and sit there and wait until they come. <laughs> today, when the phone rang at First Baptist Church where I'm privileged to serve Mary, Virginia, Craig, Dwayne, Kathy, and Shauna all answered the phone within the first two to three rings. Tomorrow, they will stand in the hallway in front of my office and reminisce about tonight and politely say to me, could you please get the phone and don't let it ring too long. 
today, Alicia actually picked my shirt up that I left lying across the bed, and she hung it up. Tomorrow, any clothes left lying around will be neatly stacked up on my side of the bed. And if I don't hang them up, well, you know the rest. I am thankful for this award today, but I know tomorrow is another day. So I'm careful to receive and take this award, but not to be taken by this award. I'm careful to read the paper, but not to be carried away by the press. For after all, today it's good, but tomorrow, who knows? Allow me also to say thank you to the administrative team, the staff, the officers, the congregation, and the people who hold what I call to be lifetime privileges as visiting members of First Baptist Church. They never join, they just keep coming for years and years and years. And so we call them lifetime visitors. <laughs> I thank God that he has placed us in the community of Binghampton and that we see fit to stay there and to serve. Because it is because of that particular relationship and this calling that I'm able to stand here before you tonight. It is because the congregation of First Baptist Church Broad Avenue still believes that peace and justice are inextricably intertwined in the mission of Jesus Christ. That is why I'm here. It is because this great congregation affords me the privilege of leading the charge of serving through individual and congregational acts. That's why I'm able to stand. It is because we collectively believe that the preaching of the gospel is still important and that the Spirit of the Lord is not only upon me, but it is upon us. He has anointed us to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent us to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. We are here because we still believe that the gospel is true and the requirements of the Lord are still the same, to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. We are here tonight because we believe